Hello, I'm Jeff Brown for Knowledge at Wharton. The stock market is up, uh, not up as high as it once was. Uh, the economy seems to be improving a little bit, but maybe not as much as we'd like. We're trying to make sense of it all, and today we have uh, two Wharton professors with us, Jeremy Siegel and Scott Richard. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to start uh, with each of you. I'll start with you, Professor Siegel. Uh, we look at these signs of the economy. It does seem like things are improving. On the other hand, we had kind of a false start a year ago, and I think a lot of people were burned by that. Yeah. So should we believe it or should we not believe it? It was a head fake. Uh, things were going up in April and, and well, it, it, through March. Uh, I, I think things are far more real now. I, the employment numbers are much better. The private payroll uh, expansion is much better. Remember, just at this time, we were hit, you know, we just had the anniversary of the tsunami and uh, earthquake in Japan. Um, and then Europe got much worse. Now, no one can, so we're going to talk about Europe later. No one can say that that couldn't flare up again, but there's been a lot of measures that have taken. Those stifled, I thought, the recovery that was proceeding at the beginning of, of this year. We take a look at even the home building, because that's been the most depressed uh, area. Uh, National Association of Home Builders suddenly moving up. That was dead last year, did not move up in March and April. I mean, today at Wall Street Journal, I saw an article about a revival of, of real estate in Phoenix. In Phoenix. Uh, can you believe that? Phoenix, I mean, of yeah, places. I mean, it was right. one of the worst. And all of a sudden, they, they see uh, a recovery there. So th I think these green shoots are much stronger now than what we had uh, a year ago. I completely agree with that. We are in the beginning of a serious recovery. Uh, both in jobs and in output, mm -hmm. and uh, I expect stock prices and bond prices will react accordingly, with the bond market going up in yield and down in price. <laughs> Finally, we've been yeah. saying that for ages. Yeah. Okay. Well, the forward uh, rates all show uh, significant rises uh -huh. uh, in bond yields built in. So you lose money, if you will, if they don't go up that much. Okay. But you think it's more solid this time than it was a year ago, is your, your bottom line on that. All right. Well, let, let's uh, zero in on the stock market for starters, sure. then we'll talk about the bond market. So, uh, Professor Siegel, uh, uh, the, we've talked over the years a number of times about what are kind of the, 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 the gears and levers inside the market that you look at to, right. to, to see what's going on, things like P.E. ratios and that sort of thing. What are you looking at now and what are they telling you? Well, I, I think, you know, when you take Stock price, actually, we can take asset prices. I mean, the, the, the two things that are important are cash flows and the discount rate, which for stocks are earnings, basically, and the interest rate environment in which you find uh, those earnings. Uh, uh, it was very favorable last year, actually. It is more favorable to me this year because the interest rates are a lot lower now, especially those long-term interest rates, uh, than they were a year ago. So uh, the P.E. ratio is about the same as a year ago, 12, 13, as we had last year. That's time. forward. That's, forward yeah, that's the forward looking in the next okay. 12 months, uh, 12, 13 on that, lower than the long run average is 15. And in an even uh, almost, well, in some ways, a record low interest rate environment. Uh, so, you know, the, the question is, is those alternatives uh, that you have out there are, uh, you know, not attractive at all. Um, you know, a lot of people tell me nowadays, well, Jeremy, there's not just, uh, you know, bonds out there. There's, there's, you know, all these other assets that they talk about and commodities and private equity and, and uh, you know, venture capital and all the rest. But you shouldn't be fooled. I'm sure that Scott will agree. I mean, fixed income is still the biggest asset class. I mean, that, that you have to compare it to. You can't, you know, they're not on all equal footing in terms of size. Fixed income is, is the big comparison there, and there, there the comparison is just, uh, I think, extraordinarily favorable. So with P.E. ratios low, the risk level of stocks looks relatively low, and you can make nothing in bonds or right. anywhere else. Of course, so when I say risk stocks, level in stocks, you yeah. know, I mean, they could go yes, lower. Sure, of the course. The bears are, you know, they, they, they like to point, well, Jeremy, you know, we had P.E. ratios of 7 and 8 back in the, in, the, in the late 70s and 80s. And I say, yeah, and that's when interest rates were 15 and 20 percent. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of competition mm -hmm. there. There isn't any competition. So to see a a P.E. ratio of 13 in, in an extraordinarily low interest rate environment 
uh, is is really extraordinary. I mean, again, and that's good. That's uh, a positive extraordinarily yeah. good, positive going forward. And I think be people are beginning to, you know, to, to put their toes in the water and, okay. and buy a little. All right. Um, We've looked, when you look at the stock market, of course, anyone who's in the market for a mutual fund is experienced in this. They say, we were the best performing fund in some, you know, period that they've selected. And you can always argue, what period should you use? The entire 20th century, the last 10 years, the last two days. You know, what what today, given what the market has done over the last few years, would be sort of a, a, a good period to look back and say, how well are stocks doing or how poorly are they doing? Well, I actually think that this period is not that unlike the 1950s, uh, mid-1950s, we had very low interest rates and low valuation of stocks. People were very frightened then. They still had memories of the Great Depression and the, the tremendous stock collapse that had there. They didn't believe the post-war recovery was real because so many economists were talking about a relapse into another depression. The fear was there. And if you remember, that was one of the best times to start accumulating stocks and one of the worst times to start buying bonds. Uh, at that time. And I'm wondering whether, you know, 10, 15 years from now, we'll look back on that and say exactly, I think, the same thing. So it would be risky to be sitting on the sidelines now. I, th I think you're missing out on great values in stocks, you know, even in terms of the dividend yield. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, this is the first time since the 1950s that the dividend yield on the S&P 500 has been higher than the 10-year government bond. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and stocks have growth and inflation hedge properties that the bonds don't have. And if you want the inflation hedge properties in the bonds and you go to tips, their yields are negative, incredibly so, in my opinion. Uh, so there's really no yield there at all. So again, I mean, uh, stocks are really, I think, the only real game in town for, for yield going forward. So, so a person who's, say, in or near retirement should really consider dividends as a, as good, a source. Good, you know, good blue-chip dividend-paying stocks, low-PE dividend-paying stocks. I think the, that's going to be your best, uh, best I know, answer. I know some of, the, some of the telephone stocks are paying over 5% yeah. these days. So. I wouldn't stay with any one or two. I mean, I would try to be as diversified as possible. I mean, I don't pick sectors or stocks, but, uh, you know, if you go and I diversify towards uh, a, a value portfolio that, that is dividend uh, tilted and dividend weighted, I, I think that will be very good performing going forward. So people who look back or read the stories about sort of the lost decade, which now not referring to Japan, but referring to the U.S. stock market, right. that would be too short a perspective. Well, we remember we started that, quote, lost decade yes. in 2000 with a P.E. ratio of 30 on the market. Right in March of 2000. And you know what? When you start with 30, you're not going to have a good decade. Right. I mean, uh, Japan uh, started in, in 1989 with a 90 PE, and they d did not have a good 30 years after that. Uh, you know, I mean, when you start from high valuation, but that's why people say, well, can't this next decade be lost? And I say, not starting from these PE ratios. Mm -hmm. okay. There's one other class you might want to look at, which is real estate. Uh -huh. Okay, so, uh, clearly cash is absurd uh, with single digit uh, uh, yields, I mean, in basis points, 10, 12 basis points. Mm -hmm. And then bonds, I don't understand why anybody in their right mind wants to lend the U.S. government money for 10 years at under 2%. It makes no sense to me at all. So if you rule out cash, you rule out bonds. Stocks are very attractive, as Jeremy said. But real estate also has a lot of attractive attributes So, so this right you're referring to real estate investment trusts or yes. actually going out and buying an investment property? Either one, uh -huh. especially if, you're, if you have the nerve in some of the sand states mm -hmm. where things have really been crushed. Now, the rental markets already are reflecting this. Rents are up nationwide. But we've never seen more affordable prices on single-family housing since the records have been kept. It's between the low mortgage rates and the low prices, this is the best opportunity that anybody have seen in 40 years of records. Uh, now, uh, talking about real estate, I mean, when people are considering their own home, they've historically been told, well, you've, you've got to stick around for four or five years to break even, given the cost of buying and selling, title insurance, things like that. If one were considering an investment property, how long a holding period would they have to commit to, do you think, at minimum? Depends on the market, of course. Uh -huh. sure. Whether 
if but uh, is it Arizona, in the six, it's not a six month flip by and flip never. kind of market. Listen, yeah. housing for the one you occupy is a consumption good. Right. It's not an investment. Yes. If you're not collecting rent, it's not an investment. You're consuming the house property. And in rental properties, that's just a straightforward present value calculation. How much is the rent I can collect versus the cost of carrying the house, the P&I and the insurance and the taxes? And I think that you'd have to be fairly foolish to, as we've all learned, to invest on the, on the come, on the capital gain that you're planning to get out of that house. I'd like to mention, supplement, I, I do agree with Scott here, but the REITs itself, the REIT index has really totally bounced back. I mean, it's within, I think, 10 or 15 percent uh, of its high that it reached pre-crisis. But so, so those is the traded. Stock, so is the stock market. And the stock market is also within that. Um, uh, in some of these individual properties you're talking about, and I do agree, the, uh, like the affordability index is at a record high. And, if, and, and even if you look internationally, U.S. real estate is unbelievably cheap on an international basis as well. Um, uh, so, uh, again, the REITs, the REITs themselves, I think, have gotten a good bounce. I still think they're probably okay as investment. But if you can, if you can get into the rentals in, in particular places, uh, I think uh, you, might, you might score very well. But, it, but again, that's a multi-year It's a multi-year, requires a little bit more yeah. specialty in terms of being able to do that. And no liquidity. There's no liquidity, no liquidity. there, yeah. as yeah. opposed to stocks, which are among the most a ultimately mouse click away liquid. From, sure. yeah. okay. and, and REITs are, and that's one reason they're back up. Yeah. Now, uh, Professor Siegel, too. Yeah. But, uh, you mentioned the foreign yeah. markets in real estate, and there are also, of course, foreign markets in stock. And, and in the past, you've been quite a strong advocate of people having a pretty substantial holding in international right. stocks. How have things changed? Is that still well, a good I think, idea? Uh, I, I think mix it's different still or what? An, an, an excellent idea. Uh, uh, we, there is more growth, you know, well, abroad, and I, I'm excluding... You know, you have basically the United States, you have the other world developed countries such as, you know, Japan and Europe, and those have moved into a slow growth period to be, to be sure. But the emerging markets have bounced back. And not only have they bounced back, but their valuations for rapid growing uh, uh, countries and firms are still extremely Reasonable. I mean, I, I was just looking at the Shanghai Composite uh, selling 10 to 11 times this year's projected earnings. And even with the come down of the squeeze in, in, the, in the Chinese uh, market, Hong Kong is like at 12, Singapore is, you know, at, at 15. Um, uh, they're all 15, 16, which I think are very good valuations. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've mentioned this before, people say, are these emerging markets for real? And I think, I think we definitely know the answer is yes, because we had the biggest economic shock in 2008, 2009, uh, since the Great Depression of the 30s. If it was going to knock anyone out, uh, it would have been the emerging markets. They've come back much stronger than any of the developed markets in terms of the economies themselves. Some of their stock markets are not quite back to that, but their economies are now over, well over the peak of what they were in 2007. If you look at so I have data since 1972 to look at corporate values, that is both the stocks plus the corporate bonds. That's grown about 1% faster than nominal GDP. So why? Well, two things have been going on. One is labor's share of the economy has been falling. And the other one is we are participating in a global expansion. The U.S. companies themselves, without diversifying globally, give you global diversification. Now, clearly, they can't keep growing 1% faster than the economy, or they become the economy. So sooner or later, they're going to have to level off and grow at the rate of the economy. But I don't see that happening in the, myself in the short run because of the uh, increasing and continuing globalization. Okay. All right. I don't know what you think. But. Uh, no, well, I, I definitely agree. And that's why some of these comparisons, people look at ratio of stock market value to GDP, it's not appropriate anymore. I mean, 45% of the profits of the S&P 500 are not coming from abroad. So, you know, you need to look at world GDP, which is growing faster than nice. U.S. GDP. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that's, that's, I think, the most important criteria and, and why I think that that divergence can go on for an awfully long time. 
Before we switch from stocks to bonds, I just want one last question, which is, what worries you the most? If, if something were to derail all of this, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what, would it, what would it be? Well, you know, I, I, I always have, in the back of I'm not happy about rising oil prices. Um, we're war. learning. War in Iran. Well, war, war in the Gulf. Any sort of war in the Gulf that closes that and sends oil up to 250 um, and is in some scenarios is, is obviously a, a threat out there. Um, a longer term threat is if, and I don't see this happening, but if there's, if, if, if the emerging markets stop growing, I mean, China and India, political things happen and, uh, you know, because I think the growth of the emerging markets are very important uh, for us economically. They're, they're the new middle class that are going to be buying so many of the goods as we retire, as the baby boom uh, population retires over the next 20 years and, and, and they're going to be the demanders of uh, goods and grow much bigger than the middle classes that now exist in Europe and the United States. So, and that's a longer term issue. Uh, you know, if, if something disrupts their growth, I don't see that happening. Short run, it is probably the, the oil question and uh, war or, or attacks in Iran. I agree with Jeremy that um, we're, I think this is going to be the century of wealth creation. You've got two billion people in the last 20 years who have come out of abject poverty into the cash economy and a huge growth in the middle class in India and China. And that's nothing but good news. Yeah. And I don't see anything that will cause that to derail if, unless their governments adopt very bad policies. The government can always do that, and there's nothing you can do about it. But both the Indian and the Chinese government seems, seem to have shedded their socialist policies and have embraced market economies, and we should see quite a bit of growth continuing out of those countries. Let's talk about bonds a little bit and, and interest rates. It, it just seems like it's been years that we've been saying we and other people, well, you know, interest rates are more likely to go up than down. <laughs> not, eventually, we're going to be right. I'm not, not blaming, eventually, we're going to be right. I'm not, not blaming you negative. guys. I say the same to everybody says Except this. For so, tips. You know, uh, Except for tips. Tips are have, negative. Have tips ever, are negative. Just give, put this in perspective. Have, uh, Professor, have we, have we ever seen a period where rates have been so low persistently for so long? Not since the Great Depression. Uh-huh. This is a post-war new, and uh, we've seen low rates uh, at the 10-year point and the like, but never cash this low, the Fed funds this low for this long. Um, and uh, Chairman Bernanke has announced that he intends to keep it there uh, through 2014, and the markets seem to be buying this. Yeah, that, that, that was quite a remarkable announcement, very unprecedented. And... I'm just curious how do the markets react? I mean, so much of the coverage of the bond markets is, you know, the speculation. Well, what are they going to do? What are rates going to be like in the future? Has this changed that element? Has it calmed them down? Uh, is it, are they just ignoring it? What's the reaction? No, I think uh, nobody in the markets ignores the Fed. Okay. Okay. Uh, they are the 800-pound gorilla. Mm -hmm. And long rates are just averages of short rates. So you have to figure out, you have to be looking at the Fed. Of course, the Fed has much, much more control over the front end of the yield curve than they do over the long end. So the reaction in the market is we've seen a very, we have very steep yield curves. The rates are not all that high, but the curve is very steep. And the forward rates are even steeper. So the market's reaction is that as the, uh, as I read it, as the economy strengthens in the coming year, the Fed is going to be holding down the front end of the curve. And so the only way the curve has to go is to move up, is to steepen. And that's what the forward rates look like, and that's what I expect will happen. And whether the Fed changes its mind and then eases before the end of 2014, I think will be very endogenous. It depends on what happens to the unemployment rate and inflation. Inflation right now is moribund, but they may have printed a lot of money. And I don't know whether they're going to be able to reel it back in in time to keep the inflation from coming out. Uh, in past years, if when the economy was stronger, if they had printed anything like this amount of money, this huge uh, easing they've gone through in the last few years, uh, people would be very worried about inflation. So it does look like rates will come up in the next couple of in years, my view, few years. Yeah. 
and they, that's what the market's forecasting as well. That's what the and, and I'd like are. to just remind people that oh, it's always difficult for, for laymen to remember this relationship between interest rates and bond prices and how a rising rate can cost you money if you've bought a bond earlier that's right. that pays less. That, that's correct, and that's a danger for people who are looking at bond mutual funds and think they're safe. Is, how, how would you gauge that danger these well, days? Well, you can buy a mod, bond mutual funds in all sorts of flavors. Mm -hmm. You can go everything from a money market fund, which probably is safe, okay, to a But long, yields zero. Yields zero, <laughs> right. Well, no free yeah. lunch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on out to, there are short-term bond funds which are yielding something like 1% mm -hmm. and are relatively exempt, mm -hmm. uh, relatively immune to interest rate movements. And then you can go on out to longer bond funds, five years, where what you say is very true. When yields go up, eventually these funds are going to suffer. Uh, offsetting it will be some spread tightening as the economy recovers. But corporate spreads are not all that wide right now, nor are they, uh, nor are mortgages. So should the investor who wants a portion of the portfolio in bonds assume that this is going to even out over time, the, the turnover in the fund will get new higher yielding bonds yeah, I and would it won't matter, or should they be worried about it? I would expect to earn your yield mm -hmm. right now. Okay. Um, I don't think you're going to get some coupon, and I expect capital losses to come in against the coupon. So if, that's what I mean by earn your yield. If you hold it to maturity, that's about the best you're going to do. But the bond funds, I mean, if they're a long-term bond fund, they'll always be selling a bond that gets too short and buying the long, and you will get that capital gain. You'll never recover it. Right, you'll get the capital loss. The loss. Yes. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah, loss. I so misinterpreted, danger, I misinterpreted yeah. your yeah. question. I with thought you were talking fund, about you, buying with bonds. With the fund, you can't hold to maturity fun. the yeah, way you can. you can't hold to maturity like an you can with bond. an individual right. bond. Okay, so... People but you should will be take wary of the bond market right I now. I would be very wary of okay. it. And I would not be a bond buyer at these yields. Like I said, why do you want to lend the U.S. government money for 10 years at 1.75% when they're running trillion-dollar deficits? All right. Now, of course, we're constantly hearing about the situation in Europe, the debt crisis in Europe. And uh, it's a little bit mystifying to many of us how that affects us. We know vaguely everything's interconnected, but how does it affect us? What's sort of the mechanism in which troubles in Europe affect uh, markets in the United States? They're a huge trading partner. Mm -hmm. And if they go through these serial defaults, like I liken it to a bank run, okay? Greece has defaulted. I imagine the market's going to turn its attention to Portugal next, okay? And Portuguese spreads are already very wide and have been widening. Um, these are less worrisome because they're small. They have small amounts of GDP. But if they start to fall and then the next one is Italy or Spain, those are big and real. The joke about Italy is it's too big to save. Okay? And uh, if their economy becomes compromised, these are people who buy a lot of goods and services from the United States. And that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt everybody who exports, okay, from farmers through manufacturers. So that's the mechanism, is trade is really the mechanism, and, I And think. do you feel uh, that, that, that they're getting a grip on this situation in Europe or not? Truthfully, no, okay? I think that um, they're getting, they're moving in the right direction. But for a currency union to work, you need several things. That's what they've got. We've got a currency union in the United States. We've got 50 states and one currency. We have a lot of labor mobility, okay? And that's what makes our currency union work. They have very little labor mobility in Europe. Not on the laws. There you're allowed to move. But in fact, there's very little labor mobility. So they don't really have a mechanism that's going to allow huge differences in labor productivity across Europe to equilibrate. The normal way of doing that was, for example, with Greece, they would have had a drachma. And the drachma would have fallen in value. Okay? And then everybody's labor productivity per unit of currency would have worked out. So the euro would have stayed strong, the drachma would have weakened, and the Greeks would have been competitive in the, in the European market. Same thing's true now of Portugal, Spain, and Italy. They have real problems in unit labor costs. Their unit labor costs are very high compared to Germany's. And they don't have a mechanism for adjusting. And that's what worries me. Well, do you think that going to the euro was a mistake? Is that what all this is pointing to? 
going to the euro was perhaps not a mistake. What was a mistake was going to the euro without having a mechanism in place to make sure that unit labor costs across the eurozone were going to remain competitive. Mm -hmm. And they had no such mechanism in place. Now, you mentioned that nobody, uh, it would make no sense to lend the U.S. government money for earning nothing. Well, I wouldn't lend it I to wouldn't. them. <laughs> uh, but there are other opportunities in the bond market. There are corporates, there are municipals, and there are junk bonds, or high yield, as they like to say. What, what do you see, sort of looking across that spectrum, uh, what looks appealing or unappealing or more dangerous or less so? Yeah, I don't see anything awfully appealing in the bond market uh, at all across the, the whole sector. Um, and that's because of, uh, I'm worried about rates going up. Now, if you hedge out the rates, then the question becomes, are any of the spreads attractive? Mortgage spreads are a little bit wide, not tremendously wide. Corporate spreads are a little bit wide, not tremendously wide. A lot of the value in corporations, if you had the nerve, was available a year ago. But they've tightened in a lot. So I don't see any real great values across the whole bond market. I don't know about you. No, I, I, I tend to agree. Um, interest rates are going to go up. Um, again, they're at zero on, on the short term. I personally do not think that Bernanke is going to be able to hold rates uh, until 2014. I think the economy is going to improve and uh, or inflation is going to increase enough that he's going to have to pull the trigger uh, and then. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, Jeremy, what's going to happen in the stock market? I said, it'll be a shock when that happens. But if you go through history, the early phases of Fed tightening are not bad for the stock market. Stock r rallies continue. It's only at the end when they really squeeze, you know, tight to, you know, slow the economy that's getting out of control in terms of inflation and, and, and resource utilization that you really begin to see the, the bear market beginning. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying on the day when Bernanke, you know, says we're, we're now thinking of, you know, withdrawing the accommodation, there will be a short-term shock there. And I consider that a buying opportunity because history shows us that oftentimes stocks uh, recover very quickly from that and continue on to the new highs as long as earnings are growing. Because remember, there's two things that affect the stock market. Uh, it's interest rates and earnings. The bond market's only the interest rate. So they don't have, if the, if the economy's gonna be stronger, you're gonna do really well on the earnings side. And that's going to be able to bring the, the, the stock market up where bonds can't go. Now, you know what I thought of was, all, some sectors of the bond market like the banks, I think are very attractive right now. But that's a view that the financial sector is healing and not uh, going down the tubes. All right. There's one other sector I want to ask you about because of your background in the mortgage securities market, and that is, uh, am I correct that, that, that the private securitization market is still pretty much dead? Moribund. Uh, and w does that matter? I mean, is there something else? Uh, I mean, I guess it's Fetty and Fran Fanny have stepped in to fill that breach. Um, is it important that we have a private securitization market? And if it is, what will it take to get it going again? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, Fannie and Freddie can only securitize a loan up to a congressionally set ceiling, which under special circumstances is now up to about 625. But the actual ceiling is about $200,000 lower than that. And there's a lot of political pressure to return it to the actual ceiling, to not make it a, uh, a jumbo loan securitizer. There's essentially no jumbo loan market. How important is that? Well, if you're the average person who's buying the average home price in the United States is a couple hundred thousand dollars, it's not important at all because there are lots and lots of conforming Fannie and Freddie conforming loan money available. If you're buying a jumbo loan or if you live in an expensive market like California or New York, it's very important because you can't buy a house, which means that the person trying to sell you the house can't sell it to you. Even though, quote, rates are low, people can't get the loans. Um, so what's it going to take to get that going? I think you're going to have to see house prices turn to some strength so that the underlying collateral, house price, uh, looks good enough for people to be willing to lend against it. Nobody in, in Wall Street days, there was an expression, don't catch a falling knife. Okay? And that's what people look at the housing market as, a falling knife. Uh, now, we have some signs, like Jeremy mentioned, about 
Phoenix turning, and we may see other cities turning. But I believe that the mortgage lenders in the bond market are going to take a wait-and-see attitude. They're not going to get in front of this. All right. Let's just finish up. I want to ask each of you to just sort of look forward to, say, a year from now. What do you think things are going to look like uh, in, in the, the economy and, and the markets that you're following? Well, since I, I believe this recovery is real, we're going to see a stronger economy. I, I think the stock market's going to be higher. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised 15 percent could even be more. Um, but we know one year projections are so so uncertain. I think the interest rates on treasuries will be substantially higher. I think within a year, Bernanke is going to have to bring forward the tightening date, and that announcement could very well be made in the next 12 months. Um, and the rising economy, and as Scott said, I think we'll stabilize the home price situation, which is not such a very, very attractive, and, and start lending on uh, in, in that market. Uh, and, uh, you know, America, we will be healing uh, in an economic sense uh, 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 in the next 12 months. The big unknown is the elections, okay? Uh, we have a very, very big tax hike built in yeah. at the beginning of next year, at the end of 1231 of this year. The rates return to the pre-Bush tax cut rates. If the House and Senate or White House, if we're split among Democrats and Republicans, it could be that it's impossible to do anything about that. Uh, and I think uh, that will not help. And that will slow the recovery uh, to hit the recovery with a big tax hike right in the middle of, of the recovery. But, you know, I, I've always been saying you're not going to get an agreement until the elections. And I'm not saying that, you know, it could be a Republican Congress and a Democratic president, but at least they'll know that's the way it is for the next four years. I mean, in a way, all right, this is my two dealing years. string. Well, two years for the House. Okay. But, I mean, this is the way that, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's going to be, this is, and, and they're going to have to make it. Um, because, as, as Scott said, if we go back to those old, that will be a fiscal hit that any, even a strong recovery will be totally derailed. Uh, so my feeling is at that particular point, oh, this is our strength, these are our negotiating points, and they're going to come to a deal. Okay. So we're optimistic, but there are a lot of big ifs out there. That's well, the bottom line. whenever there's an election year, there's okay. a big if. All right. Well, we'll hope to come back again and talk about it as things uh, evolve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.